Saving Toby from Sweet Hope by Mary Bucci Bush. Bush. Toby motioned for Osvaldo to follow him closer to the river's edge. Sand ripples showed underneath the water until a yard from shore the bottom disappeared into murkiness. The sandbar was five feet wide and nearly 15 feet long, an easy target. Toby's stones hit the edge of the bar, but Osvaldo always splashed short. Soon they were panting from the exertion. Toby poked his toes into the water. Osvaldo took off his shoes and stood beside Toby, a cool water tickling his feet. Toby told Osvaldo how a whole steamship with hundreds of people on board was sitting at the river bottom right there where he was pointing. He repeated words for Osvaldo to say, river, gold, pirates. The river flowed steadfastly past them. Ocean waves pushed a shell or a clump of weeds onto the shore, then sucked it out, then threw it back on the shore again. But the water, what, but whatever this river took did not come back. Go on, Toby encouraged him, knowing the dangers of playing in the Forbidden River. Go swim, he pointed to the sandbar. Swim on out to the sandbar, he motioned to his waist, assuring Osvaldo that the water was only that deep. Toby found a stick, then poked it into the water as far in front of him as he could reach. See, ain't even deep, he said. They were standing in the shallow water to their ankles, whipping the stick in the water and stirring up the muddy bottom while the woods behind them thrummed with insects and birdsong. Big old giant fish live out in the deep middle, Toby said. He jump, one up, he jump up one time, swallow a whole river boat all in one gulp. He squatted down so low that water lapped at his rear end. Then they were both sitting in the water. Toby flung off his ragged shirt. They leaned back on their elbows and let their legs float. The current swaying them toward the landing. Osvaldo heard a sound like branches moving or someone walking, coming from the woods behind them, above the sound of the river. He touched Toby's arm and motioned for him to listen, but no parents emerged, no sisters. It gave Osvaldo a creepy feeling as if the woods were alive and had eyes. A great white bird rose up from the grassy shore nearby and flapped across the water, pulling its long, dark legs in close to its body, its bulky wings almost dipping into the water as it skimmed the surface. And then the bird rose higher, stretched its crooked neck, made a graceful swooping turn, and landed farther down near the shore. Osvaldo, Osvaldo asked Toby if he'd seen the bird, but Toby merely flopped onto his stomach and rested his chin in his hands, his legs floating behind him. Water licked at his face and he laughed and raised his chin. He had done this only once before alone, but now with another boy beside him, it was as if he had always played in the river. Then a turtle floated by and the boys waded in water to their knees to retrieve it. Now that Toby was in the water and his feet were still touching bottom, all the warnings he had heard about playing in the river vanished. It wasn't until his foot slipped and his left and felt his leg dropping and then his body following that something woke in him. He thrashed his arms and screamed for help. Osvaldo took a step toward him and then stopped. Toby churned his arms towards the shore as the current pulled him slowly in the opposite direction. His mouth opened and shut as he tried to cry out for help while spitting to keep the water from choking him. Osvaldo turned towards the trees. Aito! He shouted, Aito! He turned back and shouted in Italian for Toby to swim, and he tried to reach an arm out to him. Finally, he ran for the stick the boy had been playing with and called for Toby to grab it. But the stick was ridiculously short. All the while, Toby's panicked eyes stayed on Osvaldo. His face bobbed farther out in the water so that he looked like a flower, a dark floating blossom. Osvaldo shared, uh, stared mutely at the bobbing flower, then took off running for the trees. Their dinner break was nearly over when Fancy Hall and, Am and Amalia Pascala each looked up, their noses raised as if catching something in the air. Their eyes moved slowly over the children and adults sprawled around them, and their ears listened, although neither of them knew in the those moments what they were listening for. Their eyes met briefly as they rose to their feet. By the time they were standing, what their bodies had unknowingly sensed turned to sudden consciousness. Within seconds, the entire group was running into the woods calling for the boys. They broke through the trees onto the sandy clearing at the same time Osvaldo leaped from the sand into the scrub oaks, shouting incoherently. Step Hall reached out as if to steady himself and caught the boy by the arm. 
For a moment, Osvaldo dangled in midair while a dozen pairs of startled eyes watched his churning feet, the great river flowing behind him. Then Step dropped the boy and they ran for the river. Fancy screamed when she saw her son slapping at the water, a dull, exhausted look on his face. He had already been carried another 20 feet downstream and farther away from shore. Step splashed into the water while his wife followed, his arm, her arms stretched toward the boy. The others grabbed her skirt to keep her from throwing herself into the river. Step's foot slipped at a drop-off and he plunged into water into his waist. He struggled against the current to keep his footing. Someone called for a rope and the scrawny old man ran back to the wagons. Another man cursed himself for not bringing a rope when they had first run into the woods. Where else would young boys be, after all, than in the river where they weren't supposed to be? As if on cue, the black Americans joined hands, making a chain of their bodies that allowed Step to venture farther into the water. The Italians added their own bodies as links in the chain, but the water became too deep and the current too strong. Daddy, Toby gasped as the water tugged at him. The distance widened between them. Amalia pulled Osvaldo close and called the girls to her side. Pray for the little boy, she told them. Seraphin waded into the water, holding on to the outstretched arms until he reached Step Hall. The shouting and crying close, close in his ears. He grabbed Step's arm and leaned over the river, reaching for Toby as if beckoning him from the water. The motion jarred him. Once again, he was touching his brother Valerio's hand. He held the fingers for a moment and then Valerio disappeared. He let go of Step Hall. His feet touched bottom for just a moment before the current lifted him and he started swimming. Fool, Seraphin, Amalia shrieked, come back. Osvaldo watched in horror as his father was carried away. Daddy, he cried out, where are you going? He knew he was the cause of this. Miscusa, Osvaldo cried. Seraphin had been fool had seen foolish young men who thought they could fight the sea and win. A dangerous attitude for a fisherman to have. He never thought of himself as such a man, but now he felt his anger against the river rising, and he tried to calm it. It was the anger that killed you. It was easy to reach the boy as he knew it would be. Returning would be another matter. Toby turned his eyes to Seraphin like a baby waking from sleep. Stai bene, Seraphin told him. You're going to be okay. He slipped his arm under Toby's, lifting him in the water so that he could breathe. Toby whimpered. The water cradled Seraphin and the boy as they held each other, and Seraphin turned his head sharply to see how far he had drifted from shore, and the sight shocked him. I may as well be in the middle of the ocean, he thought. The water felt surprisingly cold now. It tugged at his legs, and for a moment he kicked out violently, thinking he had become snagged in something, but it was only the current playing tricks on him. He plowed the water with his right arm while he fought to keep the boy above water with the other. His her he heard nothing from the shore, but he saw the tense, frightened faces watching him, the way he had watched twice from his boat. The cold water made his legs feel heavy and sluggish. The boy was weightless beside him, an empty burlap sack. Stai bene, he called out, his lips brushing the boy's cheek like a kiss. There was no answer, just a slight movement, perhaps the splash of a hand. His arm ached. He wondered how such a small child had been able to swim against the current for so long. He told himself try not to think about the pain and the distance between himself and the shore. It would have been hard enough to swim with both arms, but this way, holding onto the boy, it seemed impossible. Just one more stroke, one more, and then another, and then another. Lazaro waved his arms at Seraphin as the group followed him slowly downstream. Be strong, Lazaro shouted. Don't give up. Suddenly, Seraphin was afraid. It was as if the river had stopped for a moment and he could see everything clearly. It had not crossed his mind when he stepped into the water that he might not come out alive. Now he saw the terrified looks on his wife and children and best friend. Don't give up. Hold on, Lazaro call called, and Seraphin was stunned to realize he was drowning. What would happen to his wife and children? How could he leave them alone in the hell he had brought them to? Would the pain of his death to further burden them? Visiting him at Heiner Cemetery, where the rest of the godforsaken Italians lay. A black man waded into the water, extending a rope to Seraphin, then letting it drop when he saw that a rope was useless. Come on, Lazaro shouted, just a little more. 
Seraphin blinked his eyes hard, trying to clear the water from them, and he was surprised a second time to realize he had actually inched himself closer to shore, even though the current carried him downstream. Just his fate, he thought, to die like this, not a mule's length from being saved. The group formed a human chain again and eased into the deeper water. Seraphin found himself looking into the face of Step Hall, who held the rope. They were shouting at him and at each other, but a rushing sound filled his ears, and he could not make out the words. Step leaned into the river while the others held him. His face tensed. The eyes narrowed as he studied Seraphin's face with the look of someone backed into a corner, engaging his last desperate move. Then Step Hall tossed the loop of rope with his one free hand. Seraphin watched its slow flight in the air. It seemed to hang suspended in front of his eyes before plopping gently in the water a few feet in front of him. Several times, Step pulled into the noose, then tossed it out again. Finally, he stopped and cursed himself, fretting over the rope as if searching for the flaw in it. Then he leaned forward once more, set a steady gaze on Seraphin's face, and let go of the rope. It sailed before Seraphin's eyes for a moment, a fleeting shadow, a leaf blowing in the wind, before before floating down over his head. Step let out a quick triumphant shout, then pulled, and Seraphin felt the pressure against the back of his neck. He raised his head in the water and arched his neck to keep the rope from slipping off. And then Step reached out, snagged Seraphin's hand, and pulled him in. Step and Fancy Hall snatched their son from Seraphin as he collapsed on his knees ashore. He felt the air heave around him like the gust blowing in and out of a room. It was his family gathering at his side, and there, and then there came a barely discernible touch, Amalia's hand on his arm, removing the rope from his neck. Seraphin noticed in the same hazy way the commotion a short distance from him. Fancy Hall crying and rocking her son as the others pried the boy out of her hand and laid him on the grass. Step slapped at his son and shook him, saying, Come on, boy, come on, boy, through gritted teeth until finally the boy coughed and vomited. Fancy touched Toby's face, his chest, his arms. Did you ever think? She cried. Oh, Lord, did you ever think? Amalia slapped Seraphin across the face with such force that he fell sideways. What the hell did you think you were going out there, leaving us? She screamed at him. I know your men die in water. Dio Santo, Frienza, Frienza said, pulling her away. Amalia cursed Seraphin, beating at his face while Fierenza struggled to hold her back. Lazaro pinned Amalia's arms to her sides until she went still and she began sobbing. Seraphin right, righted himself on his knees, taking his children's hands for support. It's okay, he tried to say, but what came out sounded like he was attempting to clear his throat. He knelt for a minute, catching his breath, waiting for the feeling in his arm to return. You okay, Lazaro asked. His wife and children stared at him mutely, their silence more painful than anything his muscles had felt in the water. Let me breathe, Seraphin told them, and Toby was a newborn calf a few yards away, trembling and skinny and slick with water. His father helped him to his feet, but the boy's legs gave way and he sprawled on the ground, looking up at them with bewildered eyes. Step put his hand on the boy's head. Lay still now, he told him. Let your strength come back. One of the men took off his shirt and laid it over Toby's chest. Seraphin felt his hand stinging now from the water, drying in the cuts he had gotten from baling hay. Pale, bloated lines crisscrossed his palms, the whitened edges of the cuts like the ma mouths of dead fish. He was there all over again four years ago, looking into Valerio's white stone face as he lay dripping in the bottom of the boat. The awful understanding. His brother was dead. It was final. There was no changing it. If they had pulled him out of the water two minutes sooner, one minute, who knows? Seraphin had left in the dark morning as usual, taking Valerio along as he sometimes did. They had slipped out into the deep water with Valerio, talking about a girl he had met on the Via Villanova, no Via no Via no Via <laughs> talk uh, how he had walked with her all the way down to the sea and had gotten up the courage to kiss her just when she bent over to pick up a piece of driftwood. I was kissing the air, he laughed, talking, talking, always talking. They had gone out in his boat with Valerio, talking and talking and returned three hours later with Valerio dead. There was no way to explain the anguish. Valerio was no more. Seraphin knelt at the riverbank, clutching his stomach, sobbing. And yet the boy, Toby Hall, was saved. 
Wonder mingled with grief, astonishment as heavy as grief and painful too, and astonishing, beautiful pain impossible to comprehend. Valerio, after four years dead, you have come back to us? The others watched uneasily. Step Hall's jaw tightened as he waited to see what would happen. It's okay, Lazaro told Seraphin. He tried to take the man by his shoulders, raise him to his feet, but Seraphin could not be moved. Everything's all right now, my friend, he told Seraphin in a gentle, coaxing voice. Lazaro and Fiorenza exchanged, exchanged glances with Amalia. It had been a while since they had seen Seraphin like this. Amalia had been on the verge of telling Fiorenza of her plan to take the children and leave Seraphin, even though such a thing was infam infamente. But then Seraphin started to talk about America and his old self came back. So she stayed with him and never mentioned the secret that she carried in her heart. Seraphin glanced over at Osvaldo as his, at his bare feet. The wet clothes. What the devil were you doing in that river, he said. His voice was weak, but the words made sense now. Osvaldo stepped closer to his mother, keeping his eyes alert. It's okay, Lazaro told him. Grazie a Dio. Nobody got hurt. Hurt? Seraphin shook his head as if he did not understand the meaning of the word. Go get your shoes, Amalia scolded Osvaldo, the fear trembling beneath her words. Osvaldo trudged away, searching the riverbank for his shoes. Seraphin's own shoes were on his feet. He thought of this now, how if he had taken them off first, it might have been easier to swim. He could have drowned because of a pair of shoes. Step Hall was standing before him. He grasped Seraphin's hand with a powerful grip and pulled him to his feet. Step squinted into Seraphin's eyes as if straining to see something. Seraphin smiled uneasily, trying to move his hand away, but Step Hall squeezed the hand tighter in his. Seraphin flinched from the pain. Niente, it's nothing, he told Step. I did nothing, he looked around helplessly. You, you saved us both. Lazaro laid a hand on Step's shoulder. Finally, the man let go of Seraphin. They stood awkwardly like drunken men, unable to speak, not even knowing what it was they wanted to say. Step looked out at the river, then over at his wife and boy a long time. His feet were led. For all his dreams, he was useless after all. He turned and called gruffly for the group to move along. He lifted his son and laid him against his shoulder like a baby, and when he started walking, his family and friends followed. The Italians fell in behind them, Osvaldo barefoot and carrying his shoes in his hands while his father stumbled forward, steering the boy with one hand laid across his neck. Seraphin squinted ahead at the dark shape resting in his father's arms, the boy who was not Valerio. Behind them, Amalia and the girls trailed, subdued and silent, and Lazaro and his wife and the old lady back to the hayfield below the levee back to the sweet grass and the grazing cows and the acres of flat, silent, dusty land away with from the beautiful, merciless river.